Titus chapter 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. So Paul here is pointing out some things to be gleaned and applied to our Christian walk. Um, verse 2 begins with the phrase, in hope of eternal life. Uh, the next phrase is, with God who never lies. Now, where do we look to our hope in eternal life? Uh, who told us about it? God. Uh, in fact, the verse continues, uh, he promised this before the ages began. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all part of a big run-on sentence. Uh, so to paraphrase all of this together with verse 1, we see Paul here telling us he's a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus, for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, hoping in eternal life, which God talked about before the world even began. And he doesn't lie, so we know it's true. Um, stated like that in a, in a um, sort of a conversational aspect, it, that's a pretty profound statement. Um, and one that I think may tend to get lost in the, in the, uh, the English of, uh, of the Bible. Uh, one, one, another interesting note to be mentioned here is the word hope. Uh, we in English think of hope in the following way. Did you turn the stove off? And the answer is, well, I hope so. Uh, hope is used here in the, in the Bible means to look forward with confidence to that which, that which is good and beneficial. The fundamental difference in hope, as we understand it, uh, and in the biblical definition, is ours is ours carries the con connotation of like, well, maybe. And the biblical definition really is much closer to we confidently know it's going to happen in the future. Um, our faith and our hope rest firmly on the promises of God and his grace. He cannot lie. So we hope in the Greek sense. Um, we lean into his promises and his might because we know he cannot lie. Chris? Hey, that's that's really good that the bringing out of hope and you know, I was, I was saying that as you mentioned it and reminded of what I was thinking when, when doing this study is that the idea of this hope of eternal life is spoken of uh, in such a different way almost than I think the majority of Christians, including myself, think about it. You know, they talk about this hope of uh, the resurrection or the hope of eternal life or, you know, um, our blessed hope and all these different things like it was pretty forefront on their mind, like it was this this fact that we had been um saved from death you know it was a was something that was considered in a lot more real way than i think it is uh now in that in that we may die in the natural but we will literally be physically raised it's a hope of of, of being raised incorruptible and it's a interesting thing how they uh how it seemed to be so such on the forefront of the early church's mind but uh anyway so he says a hope of eternal life which god that cannot lie, promised before the world began. And there's just so much doctrine in this one verse, uh, you know, especially for being a particularly small one. You have the doctrine of eternal life. That's that's one by itself. But that it was promised before the world began, which has some major doctrinal implications there, uh, too. Interestingly, it's also mentioned in 2 Timothy, uh, which says, it's 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, which says, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And even this little nugget here of, of doctrine is thrown in where he says that God cannot lie. I mean, it's just, you know, just throws it in there. You know, God cannot lie. That's a pretty profound thing in itself, you know, that God can't do something. But... Um, Interestingly, is that there is another thing that God cannot do, and I must confess this is another Chuck Mislerism, but uh, what God cannot do is learn, and I think that obvious why he can't learn is because he knows everything. And this does have a very interesting implication uh, for you and me because it means that if God knows everything, he cannot be disappointed in us, which you know, we might be disappointed in ourselves when we stumble or whatever, but uh, God always sees us in the same way with the righteousness of Christ. And he wants us to learn from those stumbles and those mistakes. And we are going to learn from them. 
uh, every one of them, if we are in him and he is in us. And you can see the study that Mike and I just got done in Galatians for, for more on that. Uh, Mike, go ahead. All right. Uh, Galatians, I'm sorry. Ha, 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 Titus, <laughs> um, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 3. And at the proper time manifested in this word, through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. So this phrase, at the proper time, uh, is something of a bit of a quandary, really. Uh, it could be referring to the placement of Jesus in the stream of history, according to the will of God. It could be referring to the fact that Greek was used and spoken almost universally in the realm, uh, and the Pax Romana, uh, or the peace of Rome, dwelt within the land, making communication and travel comparatively easy, uh, or any of a number of other options. Uh, we do see here in 1 Timothy uh, 2.6 similar phraseology, tying it in some way to Jesus' appearance on the stage of history, although it's definitely not conclusive. Uh, it's interesting as well that talking about Jesus, we see here the phrase manifested in his word. Uh, the word in the Jewish mind had a very close tie to Jesus, uh, the Son of God. Uh, 1 Samuel 3 mentions how the word came and stood before Samuel. Uh, and finally, we see that Paul has been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Paul was commanded to preach to the nations all that was revealed to him by God. Uh, this is the commission he got when he was blinded on the road to Damascus. Uh, Jesus himself called to preach to salvation uh, to the world. And so, I mean, to that end, he's just carrying, you know, uh, Paul was often very fond of military metaphors, so I'll stretch it. I'll stretch it just a little bit and say he's just following orders here in some way, shape, or form. Um, Chris? Yeah, um, I had definitely had a lot of that same sort of stuff there. But that the idea that hath in due times is is just an interesting thing to me because it it's it's like the question, well, why did Jesus have to come when he did? Couldn't he have come later in history or earlier in history? It's just a pretty profound doctrinal question in itself and it has the same meaning here as the fullness of times which we've already looked at in galatians chapter 4 verse 4 where it says but when the fullness of times was come god sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law this is a profound question so um why did he and there's a lot of as you mentioned um well before i, I mentioned some of those things the word there for this due times or perfect time uh, is karios, which means the set or proper time. So it's it's not saying um, you know it's saying the time that was sort of prescribed for for this. So as you mentioned, some scholars go into different things. Pax Romana the, that Alexander the Great had you know unified the languages, so just about everybody spoke Greek. I mean, if you did a missionary journey to some far off land. You know, they spoke their own language, but they spoke Greek, you know, more than likely as well. So it made the ability to evangelize even vast areas of the ancient world, um, probably even more so than today in a lot of ways. Um, although English is, is kind of becoming that language, but not, not in that same way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think. Uh, but, but I personally think that all those things are probably true in more or less ways. But the reason that Christ came when he did... Uh, I doubt that we're ever going to know the fullness of the answer to that until, you know, on this side of eternity anyway. Um, but I'm sure it's pretty profound. So uh, the other part of this verse says, manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. So the preaching of the gospel, the good news, that we can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ was committed to Paul. But also, this is committed to us, as we see in many different places. In fact, one of my favorite verses is in 2 Corinthians, where it talks about this word of reconciliation to God, uh, being committed to every, believers, every believer. In 2 Corinthians 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God, 
was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. And though, and though God, as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And I think that uh, just really sums up a lot of the things that we've been talking about, uh, not just here, but also in Galatians. So it's just a, a great verse. Uh, and I guess we'll move on to verse 4, Mike. Titus, chapter 1, verse 4. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Verse 4 is the end of the salutation of the letter. We see here several interesting things. Uh, Paul has taken what could be considered, at least by Western standards, to be uh, a pretty lengthy introduction, and he made it all one sentence. Uh, he claims right up front uh, to be a servant, uh, or some Bibles translated as bond servant of God. Uh, he views Titus as one of his close associates to the preaching of the gospel and the revealing of God's great mercy. Um, we see here in verse 4 by the fact that Paul calls Titus his true child in a common faith, uh, that all of this that we sort of talked about earlier uh, is, you know, it's true. He really sees him, uh, just like Chris said, you know, Titus and Timothy were his trusted associates. This is his true child in a common faith. Uh, it's interesting, though. Paul was Jewish, uh, a shoot from the tribe of Benjamin, uh, and Titus was a Gentile. In our study of Galatians, we noticed uh, we noted that Paul refused to have Titus circumcised in the face of outside pressure to do so. And later in the epistle, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Uh, Paul saw no difference in his Jewishness and Titus' Gentile background before God. Um, and that's one of the reasons he calls him his true child. They're all part of this one, one faith. Um, while many of the Mediterranean culture saw Christianity as an outgrowth of Judaism, Paul here may be alluding to this fact that uh, this was something new, just not another part of Judaism, uh, by calling Titus a true child. Finally, Paul offered Titus grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Grace is the unearned blessing uh, or favor of God toward mankind. It springs from the eternal well of God's goodness. Peace for the believer is tranquility of the soul, a spirit at rest in God despite circumstances. Grace and peace can be known only in relationship with God, uh, only as we develop intimacy with God and his Christ. Paul desired that Titus experience these treasures. Chris? Titus, chapter 1. Verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. So Paul here is pointing out some things to be gleaned and applied to our Christian walk. Um, verse 2 begins with the phrase, in hope of eternal life. Uh, the next phrase is, which God, who never lies. Now, where do we look to our hope in eternal life? Uh, who told us about it? God. Uh, in fact, the verse continues, uh, he promised this before the ages began. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all part of a big run-on sentence. Uh, so to paraphrase all of this together with verse 1, we see Paul here telling us he's a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus, for the faith of God, um, and one that I think may tend to get lost in the, in the, uh, the English of, uh, of the Bible. Uh, one, one, another interesting note to be mentioned here is the word hope. Uh, we in English think of hope in the following way. It's electing their knowledge of the truth, hoping in eternal life, which God talked about before the world even began. And he doesn't lie, so we know it's true. Um, stated like that in a, in a um, sort of a conversational aspect, that, that's a pretty profound statement.